This is from Justin McCain, a podcast where Mike Robertson and Bob LaRue watch one critically acclaimed film and one terrible film and talk about how they are the same. Hey, everybody, and welcome to From Justin to Kane. I am Mike, and this is Bob. Hey, everybody. And uh, yeah, we're back with yet another episode. We're trying to quench your thirst for, uh, you know, all things cinema. Uh, Bob, are you excited for Black Friday? I, when is Black Friday? I believe it's next week. American Thanksgiving, I think, is next week. To be honest with you, I'm not looking forward to it because I'm in the middle of a move. And as people know, moves usually just it in, you incur costs. So mm-hmm. I'm not spending anything on both Christmas and Black Friday this year because this move is going to take too much money. OK, there you go. But anyway, what a great start. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, that that's a great segue to the films we're talking about this week. The films are 2013's Her, directed by Spike Jones, and 1991's Ghoulies 3, colon, Ghoulies Go to College, directed by John Carl Buchler. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's the third film in the Ghoulies franchise, the Ghoulies legacy, if you will. And the first film in the Her standalone franchise of That's just right. a single film. That's right. Uh, with no spinoffs or uh, sequels announced. Yes. So, yeah, we watched these movies and they were both good, even though, you know, Ghoulies 3 is bad. They're both a good time. Ghoulies 3 is a good time it's it a is. it's if you know what you're getting into it's a very enjoyable it, there's a lot of levity there's a lot that doesn't make sense but you just enjoy it anyways i loved it and the puppetry is great yeah there's something to be said for like silly monster puppet cartoony kind of movies and i think films need to give more credence and screen time to toilets Yes, I there agree. Was a, there was a, a turlet every other scene of this film. I know, a lot of turlets and in this film. A lot of turlets, and some were sort of your more traditional turlet, and others had like wonderful sort of engraving and sculpture to it. Um, yeah. Some of them glowed. Some of them had obviously like uh, dry ice in them, and so <laughs> there was this fun mist sort of coming out of them. Yeah. It was, it was very tur- turlet heavy, and I... Uh, I was I was living for it, and I was surprised. I was caught off guard by how many turlet shots there were. Yeah, I mean the whole the whole thing with ghoulies is that they are goblins or like little creatures that come out of turlets because they're summoned. They're like little demons, I guess, that are summoned. Have you seen ghoulies like the first one? I never saw the first one. I did see the second one though when I was a and- wee lad, and it, it was traumatizing to me. I remember watching it and being scared because <laughs> I think my dad. My dad rented it because he thought it was like a kid movie or a movie that would like a the kids would like because that makes sense. It looks kind of fun. It looks it's childish. also clearly like an eighties horror film too. But so this was another was example, it, not unlike Akira, where a film was rented for me. I think uh, <laughs> with no understanding of what would be on the film. So I just remember being really scared because they like murder people. There's a part where they kill a clown because it takes place at a carnival. Uh, which one is better, two or three? Uh, as I understand it, the second one is the best one. The third one is the second best one. Uh, and, and the first people, one, people say four and four and one are tied. Tell us a little bit about uh, Ghoulies three. Ghouls go to college or whatever the hell. Ghoulies go to college. The semicolon. Ghoulies go to college. So there's not a lot of information about this movie on the internet, believe it or not. Really? So that's that's all I have to say. No, what what to tell me about her? <laughs> Just kidding. There's there's a little bit. I would love that. There's a little bit, but it's mostly about the Ghoulies franchise as a whole. The third one just seems like a. There's not much storyline behind the making of it. It's like, hey, let's try and make some money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. By making a straight to video movie, not on like the Lep franchise. What what a cash cow! Ghoulies, Leprechaun. I, yeah, they basically were like, we got creature effects, we got scary kills, let's make money just by making these straight to video. And they did. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, um, the first Ghoulies movie, I believe, came out in 1984. Basically, like, Charles Band, who is a producer, 
uh, who is known for a lot of like 80s schlock films like Puppet Master, which ties oh, back yeah. to um, A Talking Cat. Charles Band worked with What's His Putts, uh, the guy who made A Talking Cat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he was making these 80s schlock films. They made Ghoulies 1 and uh, Ghoulies 2, which I believe Charles Band himself directed. And then the third mm-hmm. one uh, was directed by John Carl Buchler, who was a special effects guy. And so uh, John Carl Buchler is famous for directing Friday the 13th, Part 7, uh, which is, I guess, a lot of horror fans like that one. Yeah, so John Carl Buchler did a bunch of special effects stuff. He did Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. He did From Beyond. He did Reanimator, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Troll. Um, Never heard of any of those. And Puppet Master. You're just naming indie films, right? Yeah, just indie films. <laughs> so <laughs> This is underground 80s indie films. I've never heard of any of these. Well, Last Crusade is the indie film of the 80s. Oh, clever. Because of indie. Oh, because it was financed through a group of people who oh, pulled geez. their money. And it was outside the studio <laughs> system. Wow. I get it. I'm just kidding. I know it's Indiana Jones. I'm not... Uh, oh, I know you know. I'm not daft. So John Carl Buchler actually died last year, which is sad, uh, but he's super well respected in the industry, even though he kind of just made schlocky crap. But mm-hmm. his special effects are great. Like if you've ever seen Reanimator or From Beyond, these, both of those are Stuart Gordon films. Mm-hmm. Uh, the special effects are awesome. And some of the... I mean, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies... Regardless of whether they're good movies, the special effects are great. So he's like a, a powerhouse of the '80s um, special effects. And, and was scene. was he physically in charge of the like special effects department? Like he was like yeah. a Stan Winston. Like he would build creatures and mechanisms and f- fog machines and shit like that to you know get it cooking and make it creepy. Or yeah, he was he was yeah. the the head honcho. Uh, he designed mm. the ghoulies. And he kind of like did was he? a puppet guy of the ghoulies. I wouldn't be surprised if he also did the voices of the ghoulies. Because also this is uh, the first ghoulies movie where they talk. The other ones, they don't talk. Oh, really? You know, I I, I noticed they had a lot to say. They had a little too much film. to say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I thought they were a bit chatty for for, yeah. for what the, their purpose was. They knew a lot of human idioms. Yes. Yeah. They knew a lot and of they human liked idioms and riff. puns. Yeah. They were it was just like hanging sure. out with three annoying improvisers. Yes, yes. You know, you go out for beers and uh, there's and three friends riffing. and Just playing zip, zap, zop in the pizza parlor, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, oh, so oh. The, I, have only, I only have a few more little pieces of info about this movie. Not a whole lot. Okay. So four, the, the film franchise uh, is made up of four films and a novel, question mark. As in, there's a novel about the ghoulies, I guess, like that tells is the it, story. Is it canon, though? I believe it is. Wow. Written um, by, by whom? I don't know. I didn't look into it, but I was surprised. Was it written was by the ghoulies? It may have actually been written by the ghoulies or written from the ghoulies' perspective. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah. So, from guess, inside the turlet. Um, yeah, from inside the turlet. That's what it's called. <laughs> inside <laughs> the actor's It'd be cool if there's a fifth, a, f- a fifth film and it starts... And it's just like the camera goes, you know, it, it, steady cam shot, weaves through a house into an attic bathroom and then into the toilet. And the entire film takes place in the underworld where the ghoulies dwell. And it'd be really cool to learn about their world and like how moist is it in in the toilet world? And do they use money? What's their economy like? Do they what political system oh, do they use? The economy is turds. Oh, I see. Okay. So apparently, uh, I just looked it up. Apparently, the um, Ghoulies book is actually a not a novel novel. It seems to be a Ghoulies companion book. It's like a book that just kind of talks about um, the movie history. Oh, well, that that would be a good read. But I wouldn't consider it a novel. I wouldn't consider it a novel, although that's what um, Wikipedia says it is, so... Yeah, maybe somebody should talk to Mr. Wikipedia I and know. get his facts straight. Uh, each film in the the Ghoulies franchise moves away from the original genre trappings of the first film. It's just they is it, is it becomes more and more like comedic to the point where Ghoulies Three is basically a Three Stooges movie where they like kind of half-assedly kill people. 
Yeah, I was going to ask, was the first installment actually a horror film, yeah, like a the, dedicated horror film? The first one is more of a horror film with like light comedy elements. The second one's a little funnier. Uh, and yeah. the third one just like is straight slapstick with, it's not scary at all. No, I enjoyed the levity. It felt like I was just watching Police Academy. Yeah, kind of, yeah. It kind of has that. You know what I mean? It was like, of, yeah, yeah, it had that vibe. It's a horror comedy for sure. Um, yeah. but anyway, uh, at the time it was made at the same time as gremlins to the point where, uh, both ghoulies and gremlins thought the other one was ripping each other off. Was there a lawsuit? And Warn- yeah. Warner brothers sued ghoulies, but it didn't work out. And then, mm. but then Charles band ran out of money and they, uh, just kind of like waited until gremlins fever passed. And then ultimately it was a benefit to them because gremlins was a hit. So Ghoulies kind of had like a coattail to ride. Yeah, I mean, abs- that, I'm sure that helped their box office. And Gremlins is like a a super scary kids movie. Yeah. Um, is it R rated? No. Gremlins? I think it's like no, PG-13 it, at the most because I saw it a lot when I was a kid. Yeah, because that that's that's the film like uh, 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 in Christmas, the dad dies in the chimney. Yeah. Right, like Joe Dante or whatever that guy's name is. The director, um, that movie is pretty dark. Yeah, it's pretty dark. They when they put the grim, the gremlins in blenders and like just murder or, or them. the microwave. Yeah, in the yeah, microwave. like there's some gnarly business. Yeah, it's it's pretty violent. They murder those gremlins. Murder a lot of people. If if anything, I would say Gremlins is more disturbing than Ghoulies. I would agree. Yeah, Ghoulies. Yeah, three Ghoulies especially had some like really cartoonish violence, like. Body the, parts the were plunger. stretched like cartoonishly. Yeah, the plunger in the face. <laughs> yeah. That looked like a Beetlejuice gag almost. Um, so uh, just the last point I want to go through here, the yep. ghoulies. There's three ghoulies in this movie. There's fish ghoulie, mm-hmm. cat ghoulie, and rat ghoulie. So fish mm. ghoulie was the bald guy. I just thought that was like ch- like a baby ghoulie, but apparently it was his name is fish ghoulie. Uh, like I'm, I'm assuming uh, P-H-I-S-H. Uh, H. Yeah, he basically just tours around the country watching a jam band. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to make a joke like he's just such a fish head. Like he loves yeah. the band Fish. <laughs> can't, I, I, he can't get enough of fish. I can't shake this ghoulie. He just follows them around. He just loves following them around, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm glad you and I both went in that direction. Oh, yes. Well, thanks for the setup. Uh, you're welcome, Mike. You're welcome, uh, anyway, apparently there is other ghoulies that are not present. So there's only three ghoulies present in this one. But in the other films, there are also flying ghoulie, monkey ghoulie, mm-hmm. clown doll ghoulie, other fish ghoulie. There's like a second <laughs> fish ghoulie. Uh, toad ghoulie, giant ghoulie. Uh, those ones make an appearance in the second film. Mm. Uh, and then light ghoulie, which I don't know what that describes i guess maybe dark ghoulie is like the opposite of that those ones are only featured in part four. Oh, okay so yeah other fish um, ghoulie i guess is like a smaller version of the other of the main fish ghoulie which is the the kind of like the the hero of the franchise if you will right right he's the one who's on the, he's on the covers sticking out of the toilet yeah I, yeah i mean he's he's the titular ghoulie he, he kind of is yeah he kind of is like the the hero of the piece did Fish was was Fish ever approached to do the soundtrack the the OST of uh, the Ghoulies uh, <laughs> franchise? Yeah, he, they did do the music for this movie actually. Oh, I can't believe I didn't notice that. Yeah, you could really tell because it sounded like someone was just going through stock music of like comedy music. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was Trey Anastasio from Fish, like actually just jamming out. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. Um. Anyway, th- those are all of the facts that the internet has about this film, and they're mostly about Ghoulies 1. Fascinating. I could have learned more had I bought the companion book, which was kickstarted. And how much does that cost? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't buy it. Man, if we had a Patreon and people actually paid, we would have a budget to buy companion books. If our canines were, if they were like true fans, they would buy us the book and send it to us. Like some, some podcast people, people send them mail. With gifts. Yeah, you get gifts. Yeah. Shit. Well, one day, Mike, we're, we're going to get a gift in the mail, and it might just be a tiny model turlet from oh, that'd be sweet. the Ghoulies uh, franchise. That'd be that'd sweet. That'd be awesome, actually. Yeah, that'd be dope. I wonder if there's um, any Ghoulies plush. I'm sure there are. 
Yeah, I bet there is. Surely, surely there are, right? There's got to be. Uh, well, I have some. I have some other wild information about this film. But, but can I what, have it? No, I will save. I it. I'm going to save it for the uh, comparisons. Oh, you salty dog! There's you. some. There's some Jeez. interesting stuff about this movie, but I. It kind of fits better in the uh, comparison section. You really know how to tease uh, the audience. Yeah. Anywho, I'm going to talk about her now. Nice. Um, all right. Her written and directed by Spike Jones came out in 2013. Um, it was nominated for a few Oscars. It won for best original screenplay. This is also the only screenplay that Spike Jones has written and directed. He's, he's, uh, he's exclusively directed, um, other people's, uh, feature length screenplays. A lot of them um, Charlie Kaufman movies. Yeah, they yeah. Uh, Arcade Fire did the soundtrack, which is kind of cool. Very um, cool. The cinematography was by uh, Hoyte von Hoytema, who that's right uh, has is now the main collaborator with Christopher Nolan on his three most recent movies. He's a he's an amazing cinematographer. And oh he yeah. Does, a great job. Did he do Skyfall? Um, no, that that was Deacons. No, he 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 did Spectre. He did Spectre. Yeah, Spectre had some cool yeah. scenes in it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. Uh. So many. Uh, I guess I'll talk about like some of the shooting, and then I'll work my way out from there. Um. Or maybe I'll talk about the genesis of the film. So according to Spike Jones, the idea came from he was using an app, and it was just like a little gimmicky. Not AI, but just a program where you could ask it questions and it would talk to you. Mm-hmm. And it was very like poorly written and there was no AI. So it broke down and it, you know, obviously the conversation devolved. But that that was sort of the impetus for him. And he got the idea of like, well, what if there was an OS, an operating system with AI and you could have a real conversation with it? And that was the genesis for this um, film. Play. The next question he asked himself was, what if you could blink that OS? What yeah, if you could exactly. smooch and the OS? Yeah, what if you could smooch? What if you could boink? What if you could snuggle the OS? And uh, snog is the snog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or shag the OS if you're British. Wow. Snog is also British, isn't it? Yeah. That's like British British making out. They have dumb words over there. Anyway, go on. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so they he wrote it and then... They they shot it. Uh, amazing cast. You got Joaquin Phoenix, Rooney Mara, Amy Adams. Uh, Olivia Wilde has a very brief scene in it, which is pretty cool. Uh, Spike Jones has a cameo, as does Hoyte von Hoytema. Um, he he's in a party scene playing with some kids mm-hmm. in the grass, and then Spike Jones uh, does the voice of the little alien video game character, which is kind of cool. The little like weird misogynist alien that helps get you out of the cave that you're trying to get out of. Yeah. Um, the so what's cool is on this film, from what I've gathered, this wasn't explicitly stated anywhere that I read, but this is this is the the information I've gathered from several sources and piecing it together. It seems like this is the film that Rooney Mara and Joaquin Phoenix met on, mm. and they were friends for three years following this film, and then they fell in love in 2016, and then they got married, and then now they have a baby named River. Which is pretty cool. Took them long enough. Yeah, it took them seven years mm-hmm. to make a baby. I mean, geez. Um, it only took uh, Lilith and Fraser like one season on Cheers to make a baby. <laughs> and it took Carla like two or three episodes at a time to make a baby. So, you know, get it together, Rooney Mar and Joaquin Phoenix. Anywho, um, there's a lot of stuff in this film that's cut out, which is interesting. So there's like a whole documentary subplot with Amy Adams character and they like shot interviews for like some supposed documentary that never ended up. Um, there's also like a dream sequence or no, there, oh no, that is in the movie, but it's, in, it's on like a motion billboard. Never mind, Ignore that. But also Chris Cooper apparently filmed several scenes and none of which made it into the film, which is interesting. Um, and I love Chris Cooper, and it's kind of interesting that they shot with him, paid him money, and then everything ended up on the uh, cutting room floor. What happened to that guy? Neat. He was in a bunch of movies. I, I mean, he's great at adaptation. He he's he's still and, working like American Beauty. What movies has he been in recently? So what have you he done for just, us lately, Chris Cooper? <laughs> he was in the Amazon series Homecoming. Oh, okay. He, he plays the CEO of Homecoming, the corporation. 
And uh, it's a great show, and it's like 20 episodes or something with nice. Julia Roberts and Janelle Monet, I want to say is her name. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great. It's a really good uh, show, and he's amazing in it. Um, he's, of course, also in New York, I Love You, a rom-com sort of anthology film uh, that I recently saw. He has some scenes with Ethan Hawke, I believe. This doesn't matter. Anywho. No, it's So fine. a bunch of it. Also, they just re-released um, like uh, a couple weeks ago the uh, adaptation on Blu-ray. Really? Hasn't been on Blu-ray since like 2016 or no, 2006-ish or whenever Blu-rays first came out. Oh, that's cool. I love so, adaptation. That's a great movie. Yeah. Um, I actually just watched an interview with John Malkovich on being John Malkovich, and it was very interesting. Oh, is it w- the one where John Hodgman interviews him? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Have you? Did you watch the whole thing? I did. There's a great part in it where he he does he's talking about memes. Yeah. And he does the sitting <laughs> on the toilet meme, where he's like sitting on the toilet. <laughs> Sitting on the toilet. He just does, is John Malkovich it. doing this. He's like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> Sitting on the toilet. Sitting on the toilet. Sitting on the toilet. Uh, it's so dry. Yeah. And I've never seen the meme, but him explaining it, I'm like, he he would be John, like I love John Malkovich, but he would be the single worst person to retell a joke. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, I don't think he's capable of telling, like, retelling a joke or a funny scenario. He's a funny guy, though. He he is funny, but only only in his style. Yeah. He he also called it tweeter or something. Oh, like, yeah. he's, you know, obviously, like, a very talented actor and very well respected, but, like, a bit old and out of touch. And, and like, good, good on him. Like, you, when you're that famous, you don't need to, like, you know, sell yourself to social media. Um, apparently he's a Republican. It, oh, really? Which is weird because it seems like it would go against what kind of his, his you know com- how he I, came up in film. Like, I, being I bet he just guy. hates, I bet he just hates paying taxes. That's probably I what mean, it is. Yeah, he's probably, it's, yeah, it's probably just because he's so rich. He's like, I have to be a Republican if I want to not pay tax. I have to be a Republican if I don't want to pay taxes. I'm not doing a good impression. It's, it's, it's a hard impression. His is particularly yeah. difficult. Um, I hate paying taxes. That's better. Eh, it's getting better. Um, anyway, sorry, go on. <laughs> uh, no, no, that's I okay. might cut that out. I don't uh, think that's good enough to keep in. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it depends how many more times you do it, Mike. Um, or should I say... I hate John. paying taxes. I don't know. It's hard. I watch. He probably loves paying taxes and he's just like a weirdo. Yeah. Um, for some other reason. Anywho. I um, hate paying so taxes. The film was shot in both Shanghai and L.A. And a lot of the wide sort of the, the wide establishing shots and exteriors of, you know, the futuristic uh, L.A. is just modern Shanghai. Oh, cool. Um, which is cool. Um, so they, and they, if you look, you can tell it's Shanghai and not L.A., which is kind of neat because they, they didn't really change anything. I didn't like, really There's look. like, yeah, you, you, I don't think you really notice at first glance, but like there's like signs that are obviously in Chinese. Yeah. And you're like, hmm, interesting. Well, I mean, a lot um, of people there, posit and, that the future is uh, is going to be a, like a very Chinese-based future. Like what was that show? Um, Firefly? Firefly oh, yes. had like a lot of like Chinese uh, and American kind of integration, or even the first Blade Runner. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it was it's a cool aesthetical uh, like aesthetic choice, and they I'm sure saved a lot of money shooting in Shanghai and just using the architecture that was there. I just thought it was all CG. No, I mean there are moments where there's CG. There's some sort of statue that they used in an LA shot that like that statue doesn't exist and it's uh-huh. all CG. But for for the most part, they just like. Use real locations, which is pretty cool. Practical effects. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. Even in 2013. Uh, the film was called the Rick Howard, the Untitled Rick Howard Project as a sort of a cover name for uh, the actual title. Not dissimilar to Blue Harvest, mm-hmm. uh, the old Star Wars name. Oh, gosh. What else? Oh, there's a fun tidbit. So in post, apparently, Spike Jones had, a, had great difficulty cutting the film down. The runtime is too long. Yes. And he couldn't figure out how to cut it down. And he gave it to Steven Soderbergh. And in less than 24 hours, Steven Soderbergh cut it down to 90 minutes. Oh, wow. And then gave it back to him. And that was the springboard that Spike Jones needed to kind of whittle the film down into its true essence. Yeah, Steven um, Soderbergh is which, cool. 
he's he's a he's a baller and he's just cranking them out you know yeah. like and and quality stuff i love the film the laundromat have you seen it with gary oldman and uh, meryl streep no it's on my list but i've never i never watched it. it's on netflix it's, though right yeah it is and it's astonishing okay yeah i mean he's he's cool i like just how he does he just kind of does what he wants yeah, I love there's like just photos of him shooting with like the iPhone 11, but then he's using a Chapman dolly and an <laughs> O'Connor 2575 tripod head and stuff. Like it's like there's $600,000 of gear below the iPhone 11 as his camera, which is like that's kind of fun. That's like a fun little twist. Did you what, did you see that movie he made Unsane? No, I haven't seen it, but I heard it's good. It's good. Yeah, it's like a horror film uh shot it with an iPhone. Yeah, like that's that's pretty cool. I, I've seen stills and I've seen the trailer for it. And it like lo- looks like a cool movie. Was the laundromat shot on an iPhone too? No, I don't think it was. Oh, okay, it looks like it was shot on an iPhone sometimes, but I don't think it was. Did you have you ever read uh, "Getting Away with It"? That book you wrote? No, no, I've I've heard of it though. Uh, I've I have it. I've read a, half of it or most of it, and. Um, it's basically he is a, a collection of his diary entries when he was kind of coming up post uh, sex lies and videotape. Right, right. So it, it's just kind of talking about how he's such a workhorse. Like he was just working on random movies like James and the Giant Peach. He was doing like rewrites on and stuff. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. And then it's a lot of his neurosis. And then the other half, like it kind of cuts between diary entries and like an interview with Richard Lester, uh, director of Hard Day's Night. Yeah. So it's just like a weird, interesting book. Speaking of uh, Steven Soderbergh, the the lead in Ghoulies 3 looks like a low-rent uh, James Spader, mm-hmm. who was in uh, Love, Sex, and Videotapes. Yeah, Sex, Lies, or, and or Videotapes. Whatever the f- sex, yeah, 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 Sex, Lies, and video. yeah, whatever the title is. I, I can't remember it. Anywho, kind of neat, you know, the whole time I was watching, I'm like, this guy just looks like a knockoff James Spader. Well, Ghoulies were like a, n- a knockoff gremlin, so... It was truly yeah. like the 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 perpetual runner up of the eighties. Yeah, ways. I think it really embodied all of that, and it was even you know it came out ninety one, like it even missed its mark. It yeah, came out too late because like it felt like a film from the eighties, like yeah, like nineteen eighty two, eighties frat comedies, but in the nineteen ninety. Yeah, yeah, you know, Cheers uh, season nine. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Are you on season nine right now? No, I'm on season eight. Okay, but go on. Tell me about Cheer season nine, though, you were saying. No, I was just saying that's what year it would have been oh, out okay. in, is 1991, because <laughs> I'm on 1990 right now, season eight. Just a couple so, of years from Frasier. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's probably going to be my next show. I hear it's good. I'm curious to s- see how they transition the show, because what it seems like Lilith won't be in Frasier. No. And they're married, so they obviously divorce. Yeah, she was. Well, she, or I mean, something. she, she, I think she dies because she's uh, uh, allergic to toss salad and scrambled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> That's not where I thought that was going to go. Um, Keep telling facts. Um, oh gosh, what else is there? Um, yeah, so the editing was tricky. Uh, also, like Spike Jones hasn't made a film since this movie, he's well, just done, I think he has commercials. He does short films every once in a while. Well, yeah, I'm. I just think like theatrical. Like he did the Aziz Ansari special, and he's yeah. he's doing little projects, but he hasn't done a feature film since her, and that was seven years ago. Yeah, he might have produced some things that. I mean, he technically directed that Aziz Ansari special, which was not good. Yeah, or as well, Aziz would I say, mean, it's not good. <laughs> that's an impression I can do. Yeah, that's pretty good actually. Yeah. Um, we have similar sounding voices. This is the nasally thing. It is what binds us. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's just weird. Like he's so weird with projects because he. It took him like where, like where, where, where the wild things are or go or whatever that film was called, mm-hmm. based on that kid's novel. That took him like seven years to make, and then and then her came out like five years later or four years later or whatever, and then nothing since. And he's he's done a lot of cool commercials and some music videos, but he just well, and he started Viceland. He's like a TV executive too. So, oh, there you go. Yeah. So, but it's just weird that he's not making movies. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, he just seems like he 
for somebody who's done so much, it seems like there isn't a fire under his ass to like get shit done. Sort of the inverse of Steven Soderbergh. I mean, when did Bad Grandpa come out? He worked on Bad Grandpa. Uh, I think good he was. I, don't I think know. he was in Bad Grandpa. Yeah, yeah. Well, he 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 He's did all the Jackass Oh, it came out stuff. the same year as her, 2013. Oh well, there you go. There you go. There you go, Spike. There you go. And as a as an avid um, antagonist to fedoras, in a lot of the behind the scenes footage of her, Spike Jones is donning a straw fedora. For the majority of the production, and even in 2012 when they would have filmed this, that is just a no-go. Um, so just, you know, write them a letter and say, why? Why Why would you do that? Why you do that? Oh, oh, there's one last thing. So there was somebody who was supposed to play Sam, and her name was Sam... No, was it Olsen? No, I don't think it was. Here, let me look it up real quick. Spike Jones directed a movie this year. What is it? It was a documentary about the Beastie Boys called Beastie Boys Story. See, that doesn't count. I'm talking oh, okay. like theatrical films, you know what I mean? He also directed a short or a, a short film slash commercial called Welcome Home, which was for Apple's HomePod devices, which was like a... I, I've seen it. It has FKA twigs in it. It's amazing. I mean, yeah. Maybe I should log that on Letterboxd. I've technically seen it. Yeah, it's it's good. You should. Uh, yeah, you should. You should log it. Yeah, um, okay. Samantha Morton. Oh, Samantha Morton. Oh, yeah, was Samantha supposed to play. Morton was supposed to play. And then she backed out, but they kept her name as Sam in the or Samantha in the movie, which is kind of cool. And then they switched it up. Oh, oh, one one last thing. So what's interesting is so Lost in Translation was the 2003 Best Original Screenplay winner for Sofia Coppola, mm-hmm. and it's pretty obvious that that film dealt. Like, was at least inspired by the relationship. Because at that time, Sofia Coppola and Spike Jones were married, or at least common law. Mm-hmm. And then uh, in 2013, Spike Jones wins for his best original screenplay. And that is obviously informed, too, by their romantic relationship that then ended very publicly. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of interesting that they're both like auteurs and they made romance films both kind of inspired by each other and their relationship. Yeah. Uh, which is which is kind of cool. I don't think you see that very often. And they're both Oscar winners for Best Original Screenplay. That is true. Ten, and 10 years apart, even. 2003 and 2013. And they are both like kind of, kind of, kind of connected to Asia or filmed uh, in Asia. Yeah, they are, actually. They're both, yeah. And um, Lance Accord, who was uh, like a second or third unit DP on... Um, her, sh- he he shot like being John Malkovich yeah, did, adaptation, right. um, but he also shot Lost in Translation. So That's there's right. there's shared crew and uh, like shared cinematographers and stuff, which is kind of cool. Yeah, very good, very good, nice, nice. Um, yeah, in that fact. one's a little more you know wacky, but uh, anywho, yeah, that's basically it for her. Um, Great film. If you haven't seen it, why the hell are you listening to this podcast? And also, uh, you should check it out. I think it's great. Well, I mean, I've talked to some canines out there, and most people have not seen any of the movies or most of the movies we've, we've talked about. <laughs> when we started this, it was very cinephile-oriented, and we kind of went a little bit more popular films later. Yes. But, but even yeah, still, most true. people haven't seen a lot of the movies. Like, I mean, Ghoulies 3 is not... It's a deep cut. It's kind of a deep cut in a way. Yeah, it's a yeah. straight-to-video movie. But her, her, her is just a good film. Yeah, it is. I also recommend uh, people watch... Me Before You, great romance film with Amelia Clark that I rented on YouTube and watched three times in one day. When? Uh, like two days ago. Instead of watching Ghoulies 3, I was watching Me Bob, Before You multiple times. Clown. I love Amelia Clark. What can I say? What's she from? I watched Last Christmas. Game of Thrones. Oh, right. Is she uh, she's, Daenerys? She's Daenerys, yeah, yeah. Okay, I haven't watched the Dragon We've Queen. discussed this, but I've never watched Game of Thrones. I it's a it's a lot to chew off now. Like I I wouldn't watch it twice. I would never. But watch you know it's it. interesting. The the dad Lannister. Yes. I forget his name. The the head honcho, the real bad guy, the old man is the dad in Me Before You, and he's so nice. And it's interesting that they they made this movie while they were both working on Game of Thrones. That's funny. So it's kind of cool, you know. It's uh yeah, kind of neat. Kinda is it neat. canon? Is it is it got canon? It is. It is got canon. It's several thousand years later, but got it is can? in fact got can. Yeah, they're both um, direct descendants of each other's families, uh, respectively.
Um, anywho, let's get into it, Mike. Let's compare these puppies. So, uh, do you uh, did you find these ones hard to do? No, I found it pretty easy. I found it pretty easy. Yeah, this one was. I had. Yeah, like, I it, was, a, it was like a large list that would be make it, it make an unwieldy episode if we went through all of them. Yeah, I I, I just wrote down my greatest hits. Okay. L- let me do a real soft lob off the top. You always you know, like do. A real, you always start with a real, real soft. Real plate of jello that's been sitting on the counter for a few hours and is room temp, okay? Okay. Um, both deal with high pants, tucked in shirts, and top yes. buttons done up. Yeah. I had um, that on my list too. Aesthetically, yeah, there's like a shared costume design, which is kind of neat. Well, the fashion in her is uh, kind of similar to the way that 80s frat guys dressed in a way. Not yeah, always, but absolutely. like the main character who is like a bargain bin James Spader, he kind of dresses like the dweeby main character in in uh, in her. Yes, yeah, absolutely. What was Joaquin Phoenix's uh, character's name again? Um, Ted uh, Theodore. What was his last name again? He has a funny last name. A I don't Theodore, know, man. No, Theodore Twombly. Right, right. Uh, definitely a um, sort of like a writer's name. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That was a good one because their fashion is very similar. Well, thanks. Maybe it wasn't such a soft lob off the top. Mm, no, I don't think so. And also, like, nice. in, in 2013, the 80s is kind of like the decade you're looking back to. That's uh, true. For your nostalgia. So it makes sense that that would be like where the where you're like basing your future uh, fashion on. Um, okay. So, yeah. Uh, Ghoulies 3 and Her both are films which... Uh, kind of focus on the intersection of the human world and um, some other. Mm -hmm. In her, it's technology, and in uh, Ghoulies 3, it's turlet goblins. (laughs) Can I? Yeah. You don't don't have to ask. You can always jump on something. No, I, I, well, I just, yeah, I wrote, I feel like this is tangentially related. Both films have actors portraying characters without the actors ever ending up on screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Right. Yeah. So you you have you have the voice of Scarlett Johansson, and then you have wh- whomever the team is, consists of puppeting the the little ghoulies. Yeah, and those guys definitely did the voices of them because a lot of the dialogue kind of seemed improvised. Yeah, yeah. It would have been impossible otherwise. Just Frank in. Oz playing three yeah. ghoulies. And he's 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 just like secretly a really horny, raunchy dude. And he's just yeah. trying to get all nasty with this R-rated college comedy. Yeah. That's one difference between the, the two films. Her seems like a movie that kind of uh, plays with restraint as an idea. Plus also the, char- the, th- like the theme of the film is like the character trying to restrain himself from having sex with his computer, I guess. Yeah, Ghoulies 3 is the opposite of that. It's just... Just it doesn't even like have restraint when it comes to nudity. There's like literally a scene where it's intercutting between two different nude scenes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that th- there felt I felt this sort of desperation to to squeeze in. It's like they had they had a certain amount of shots with female nudity, and they're like, "Can we please put these all in the movie?" And the editor was like, "It won't make sense." And the director was like, mm-hmm. "I don't care. I just like." Boobies and butts. Yeah. And I want them. I want I want it all in the movie. Like I, I had to shoot it all. I want it in there. And the editor was like, okay, well, you get in this pretty gnarly <laughs> montage and it won't make sense. No. Well, uh, do you have another one? I no, that's it. That's the end of my list. Oh, okay. Well, wow. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, I have another one. Um, both films uh, deal with academics. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because uh, the- Theodore and Rudy Mara, I forget her character name. Both uh, worked on their masters together, and they're definitely mm. like they're both talented writers, and they're academics. And you have the um, humanities professor, and of course the setting of college where the ghoulies go to college. Right, right, right. Yeah, so I'd I'd say both both delve into uh, post secondary. That's good. Related to that, both both movies kind of start with a important document right off the top of the movie, which kind of uh, yes, kind of. Ties into the theme of the film. Uh, at the beginning of her, he's writing that letter to mm-hmm. that person, and he works for that greeting card or that letter writing company. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it's just like a a really good starting point to discuss human connection and how it kind of changes as the future goes on. Similarly in Ghoulies 3, uh, the guy's reading that comic book, which summons the Ghoulies. Mm -hmm. And like the com that kind of represents uh, the theme of turlet goblins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess also like pulp, pulp uh, horror media uh, yeah. as well. Just kind of like the obsession with that that the uh, people who made it clearly have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it, like the filmmakers in the eighties are an odd bunch because they they have such weird cult- cultural touch points a lot of the time. Like there's like the obsession with like that kind of weird pulpy, uh, horror-y, like tales from the crypt esque, um, you know, like old comics. Yeah. But then there's also classic comedy. A lot of like old comedy writer, a lot of comedy writers in the eighties and nineties will have, there'll be like references to like Three Stooges to all these old, uh, comedy things from like days past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, Ghoulies Three definitely is representative of that. Yeah, absolutely. They literally do yeah. three Stooges gags in the movie, and they, I think they're trying to really make it clear like there's three ghoulies. They're the st- three Stooges, the three Googes. Yeah. But anyway, an important document at the beginning ties the two films <laughs> together. <laughs> a little tangent there. Uh, what a what a wonderful dissertation we all just sat through there, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Well, I mean, if you like, the, if you ever read interviews with Simpsons writers, they're all like comedy nerds from the Harvard Lampoon. And their, yeah. their comedy taste is like so weird and like kind of outdated in a way, even though they write like the best episodes of The Simpsons. Yeah. Well, it's strange where inspiration can come from something so antiquated and yet it's so modern and fresh when it's created, you know? Yeah. Like it's it's strange how through that the whomever is creating that thing makes something so modern and compelling inspired by something so old. And wouldn't land in today's audience. It's no. kind of cool. Yeah. There's like a generational dissonance that occurs, but the inspiration is still there. Well, even like comedy writers now, inspired by old Simpsons, who are inspired by those old things. Yeah, totally, totally. Although yeah. you watch old Simpsons and it really lands still. Mm-hmm. I More so than the modern but maybe because I have yeah. like maybe I have a just a crazy nostalgia for it because I've seen every episode a thousand times. Yeah. Well, I think the quality was better back in the day. The yeah. first ten seasons. We should get into um, both, that. Yeah, I think we should do a mini-sode on Simpsons. That'd be great. Yeah, I've, I've seen. Yeah, let's I could do talk it. about every I, episode of the first 10 seasons at least. Yeah, we, we, we should do that, and I'll just quiz you. Okay, sure, yeah. Cool. Um, both films transcend their genre. So Ghoulies is a horror film, but what it really is is a campus comedy. Mm-hmm. And... Her is a romance film, but it's actually a science fiction movie. That's right. Yeah, good, good. Um, so so both kind of uh, play with your expectations of genre and both kind of blur the two things, you know? Both films have a character who has a tech obsession. Um, that mm-hmm. being, uh, you know, Theodore Twombly, obviously, like everybody loves computers. He likes computers to the point where he starts dating one. But then uh, also in Ghoulies 3... There's uh, that one character who's concerned when his stereo gets axed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't you be upset? Yeah, I would. Well, I mean, back then those stereos probably cost $4,000. Yeah, it's like when you got a VHS player and it was like $1,000 for yeah. the unit. And then yeah. you you had to rent the player because it was too much to buy. Yeah. But those, Crazy the, times. those VCRs were well built, though. They would last. You know, our VCR when I was a kid. We got it in the mid 80s, I think, 1985 ish, maybe, and it lasted until probably 2000. Mm -hmm. So there you go. That's a good investment. Uh, Also, on the related to tech, there's a sex scene where technology is involved. Mm -hmm. So there's characters in both films. In both films, her, he obviously has like some sort of sex scene with his computer or his, his, his OS, I guess is what they say. And the surrogate lady? The surrogate lady, like, but then there's also the part where they're just in bed and he's, they're kind of having phone sex, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just rubbing it out, listening to his OS, talk yeah. to him. Yeah, and yeah. then in Ghoulies 3, there's uh, that strange montage where that one guy and his girlfriend are like kind of just having sex with exercise equipment. 
Yeah, they were on the elliptical and then they were on the treadmill. The treadmill bit didn't make sense. No, I mean, none of it made sense. Physics. No, that's true. And it's funny when he left and she just started working out. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I've, I've never been so horny that I'm like, I got to start doing push ups. I just immediately go into, a, you know, a deep, deep sorrow. So, you know, like a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That was a joke. Um, anyways. Um, yeah. Yeah. Technology is definitely uh, uh, prevalent in both films and it's used in scenes of sexuality and just scenes of, you know, possessional obsession. Uh, I'm just going to just tag one more on there just because it's kind of thematic, really, thematically related. Please do. Um, yeah. There's characters in both films who are a non-human character who are sexually attracted to humans. That being like the OS is attracted to Theodore. And mm-hmm. um, Samantha is her name, really. Yes. Played by Scar Joe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in Ghoulies 3, the Ghoulies know that naked women are sexy. And and they kind of just like heckle. Yeah, they 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 just kind of are excited whenever they see a naked woman, even though they're all just turlet goblins. It would make more sense if they were confused by nudity. Yeah, or they. But also, they one of them's wearing like denim it. coveralls and has like a mullet. Like they're obviously informed by you know uh, Western culture. Yeah, somehow. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't seen the first one and i don't remember anything from the second one except for being scared as like a four-year-old yeah yeah i'm not exactly sure what their relationship to humans or if those are the same ghoulies that kind of came back from the other ones and so they had had enough time in the real world to be like oh this is a naked woman i i should be turned on by this as a ghoulie yeah but then also are they formerly humans not a lot of ghoulie lore. i don't know a lot of the ghoulie lore and i well you gotta buy the companion novel i guess too yeah <laughs> Canines, if you got a little dough kicking around, send it our way. Michael, read it first, and then I'll read it after. Because we haven't seen each other in person in quite some time. So, yes. you know. Uh, Rooney Mara and the leading lady in um, Ghoulies 3, Ghoulies Go to College, have a very similar aesthetic. Go on. I mean, like, just generically, they're they're like, they both have dark hair. They're both super skinny white ladies. Oh, yeah, that too. That too. I'm sure they're similar Brunettes. height. Yeah. Um, they both have complicated relationships with the male lead. That's right. Yeah. Both films are like predicated on this very dicey re- relationship between the male lead and the female lead. Yes. Um, well, I guess Rooney Mara is not the female lead, but her, her relationship is why the film or their old relationship is why her is a film. And is yeah. anything, right? Um, That's right. And yeah. to piggyback on that, both films take place because of uh, actions that have, or, or because of events that have occurred before the film happens. So in her, you've got Rooney Mara and Joaquin Phoenix. They meet in school. They fall in love. They live together. They fall out of love. They get divorced, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Um, and in uh, Ghoulies, I haven't seen one or two, haven't read the um, companion novel. But I can only assume shit went down in one and two that led to the third one happening. And also, obviously, the Ghoulies sort of manuscript was an old novel or like piece of literature that could summon these ghouls out of old Stone Age turlets. And then somebody converted it to a comic book. That was a decision made probably by a human. And that is something that happened before this film occurred. But then had very serious uh, consequences. Right, right. Suck on that, Mike. Uh, Boom. Mic drop. Okay, I guess. I guess I will. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, both are just about dweeby lead characters who kind of get dumped by a scrawny white lady. Yeah. (laughs) She should know better than to be with that guy. Uh, Yeah. And then um, also... Uh, at another point in the movie, that guy is with a woman who is like okay with him being like be uh, b- rubbing his body up against another woman's. You know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah. in Ghoulies Three, he kept that he keeps being caught just holding a naked lady. Yes. Yeah. Um, and his and his girlfriend is always just like kind of just shrugs it off. I mean, she's upset, but it's it's not, her initial reaction makes sense, but it's how quickly she gets over it that doesn't make sense. Yeah. 
and um, and her, she's her like, let's, time let's have a crazy. date. And then he forgets to date because he, de- he forgets to go on the date always because he's pranking because it's prank week. Because it's prank week and uh, Alpha Mater whatever has to get their prize back, their yeah. crown. Yeah. Um, also, there's like, okay, so his frat house was like a, the dweeb frat, I assume, because he didn't seem like yeah, the cool the, guy. The the underdogs. Yeah. But then the other frat house that they were rivals with, they also, I couldn't tell the difference visually between them. They both all had he, bad fashion. They were all ugly and they all kind of like just all seemed like dweebs. And it was it was what's interesting is college comedies always go with rich versus poor. Yeah. And that's how you can tell the two frats apart. But this just kind of seemed like everyone was poor, like of the same. <laughs> like everyone is just like middle class, like lower what, middle class. Yeah, what you know? college was this? Um, it was it was Ghoulie's college. Oh, Ghoulie U? Ghoulaversity? Yes, exactly. It was Ghoulversity. Where the toilets, the the, the turlets preside, <laughs> R- reside, yeah, reside. Also, the the, the turlet in Ghoulies Three was this wild phantasmagoric toilet, which would be cool to have, like as like a a prop to take home after you made the movie. Oh yeah, absolutely. I would keep a toilet like that. <laughs> yeah, nobody ever nobody ever talked about hey how one of the toilets was like kind of scary and phantasmagoric. I I could hear you say phantasmagoric. Three or four more times fan, this fan, episode. Phantasmagoric turlet. Phantasmagoric turlet. No, 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 no. Can you just just wedge it into the conversation, just there, it Mike? In. Okay. I'm just going to give you a challenge for the remainder of this episode. If you find the opportunity, just wedge it in. Phantasmagoric turlet. Okay. Um, I'll try and say that. Yeah. Uh, both films, like I think, are trying to make a statement about something. Hmm. Uh, in her, it's obviously like about human connection, about technology's effect on uh, human connection, yeah, and about our relationship with technology. It kind of like, yeah, it's about the future, or it's using a vision of the future to comment on the, the now or yeah. the near future, rather, even. So, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, I would say Ghoulies 3, Ghoulies Go to College, is actually pretty. Pretty good satire. I would say it's kind of Dawn of the Dead esque mm-hmm. in in that it kind of represents a certain facet of culture via the uh, horror creature. So in Dawn of the Dead, the zombies right. in the mall kind of represent like consumerism. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ghoulies, when they are birthed from the phantasmagoric toilet. <laughs> <laughs> They, uh, they, <laughs> you said toilet, toilet. I meant uh, to say toilet. That was a fantastic gork toilet is a bit of a tongue twister, believe it or not. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know when wouldn't they're know. birthed from the, the PT. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they don't really like get down to business in terms of being ghoulies, like killing. They immediately just start getting absorbed into frat culture. Yes. So I yeah. thought that, that was kind of interesting that they, are they really only like start murdering once the the dean wants to stop prank week so yeah. he just kind of hires them as like hired guns to just murder some kids you know what's funny about the ghouls what the ghoulies if you will is you you, you know how on a script like a screenwriter will be like oh so and so that character was the audience yeah in a weird way the ghouls are the audience and so? they are our vessel into this culture. What's interesting is once they're introduced, we're immediately um, shown aspects of frat culture that weren't depicted before they arrived. So like the 2001 bit with the beer cans and the drinking. And, and, and we, we just the ghoulies and us as the audience party without the frat boys there. So <laughs> yeah. we're, we're seeing the ghouls learn to party and learn to be frats. We see them learn to prank. Yeah, they um, become as obsessed with prank week or a pancake. Yeah, yeah, and and they they are us. They are yeah. our vessel into this world because it's so. The film starts off so strong in its defined world that it doesn't make sense. Like seeing that guy just sit on the non phantasmagoric turlet uh, reading the comic book. Mm-hmm. I'm just like this is like the I'm lost so far. But then the 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 ghouls the ghoulies do help us enter this universe, this cinematic universe. Well, but but I think that the 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 fact that they don't like really care about killing as much is 
as they do about partying. They're essentially just frat boys. So it's kind of a, a biting comment on, on frat culture. Perhaps mm-hmm. perhaps one of the only films daring enough to make a comment on frat culture while also some simultaneously kind of having its cake and eating it too kind of thing. Yeah, it's like condoning it and also criticizing it. Yeah, because the 80s uh, frat comedies didn't really comment on it, didn't really critique it. And even movies in the 90s that were set at college and kind of were sex comedies, they didn't really critique that, I don't think, or... Whereas I think ghoulies, by making the ghoulies frat boys themselves, like, like ugly, monstrous creatures, I think it kind of is saying something about frat culture. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I would say if ghoulies three, ghoulies go to college, great satire. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I uh, agree with you. Uh, I left the worst for last. <laughs> um, both films um, have warm weather. Jesus, Bob. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, I guess they are identical films in that way, yeah. And, and like, dare I say, like, both films have similar weather patterns. It never rains in either film. Oh, maybe it rains in her. I can't remember. Does it? I can't remember. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think it does. Doesn't that snow but, at one point when they go to that cabin? Yeah, it snows. But that that's different. That's I'm precipitation. Sure if, but no, in the Ghoulies film, if they if the Ghoulies went they had a weekend away from campus, I'm sure they could have gone to like Colorado and hit hit up the the peaks. You know what I mean? Well, the Ghoulies would go um, the, like for Thanksgiving, they would go back to their uh, Ghoulie parents' house, take the train, take the Amtrak train back to their Ghoulie parents' house, and yeah, Turletville. Mm-hmm. Um, one way ticket to Turletville. Um. I got so, a few tickets to Turletville. <laughs> uh, but in the first, like, uh, like sort of opening shot, there is a shot of very warm sunlight uh, hitting a character's face. So both mm. both films like try to start the, the their their movies off respectively with this very warm, low angled sunlight. Some both movies start with the uh, a character in a brightly kind of lit room. Uh, as mm-hmm. you described, sitting on a chair of some kind. <laughs> In Ghoulies Three, obviously it's a turlet, but it's a it's a phantasmagoric turlet. That's right, yeah. And in her, it's a it's an office chair. It's just an office chair. It's not really funny. Yeah, it's an unphantasmagoric office chair. Wait, so is is that your last one? Yeah, I'm I'm all out. Okay, well I've got a couple more. Maybe we can do a, a mini lightning round just to get through all my guests, but. Usually when you say mini lightning round, it takes 25 minutes. <laughs> this isn't a criticism. It's an observation. Well, you so actually, I, yeah, some of these, some of the ones coming up are, are wild. Are, Remember oh, I good, said that good, something I was wild? Wait. There's a wild connection between these two movies that you will not believe. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, well, hit, let's, let's start. Let's, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Mini lightning round. There's improvised dialogue in both films. Obviously the, the ghoulies. Uh, just seem like they're just bantering constantly to the point of being like, I wish this wasn't the choice they made yeah. in this movie because they're just constantly talking and saying non-jokes or puns or just just saying whatever. Yeah. Um, to, yeah, to no laughs, I found. Uh, similarly, the video game sequence in uh, Her seemed like it was kind of like improvised. Mm-hmm. Kind of had that kind of loosey-goosey flow to it. So like a non-human character in the human world, kind of improvising dialogue. Yeah, yeah. Um, both films have a lot of hidden celebrity cameos. Ooh. Kristen Wiig, Bill Hader, they both do voices in in her. Spike Jones does some as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, for all the phone scenes. Yeah. Like the cat choking. Oh, that's so funny. I forgot about that scene. Yeah, and uh, Ghoulies 3 has a wild, wild cast list. What is it? Well... So, I mean, what's his face? Kevin McCarthy plays the Dean. He's yeah. from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I mm-hmm. know him best from the Weird Al movie, UHF. He plays RJ Fletcher <laughs> in that movie. Shout right. out to RJ, Criterion Creeps. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, RJ. Yeah, so that's like wild that he was in this movie because to me, he's like a big, yeah, I, I just assumed he was a big actor because I guess he just kind of did pulpy movies. Yeah, and like, was he busy in 91? Like, what? It's not like he, 
Like, did 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 the eighties treat him well? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, UHF was a flop. Even though I don't see right. it, I don't see it as that. It was actually a flop, and right, it has right. aged better. Like it became a cult film. But anyway, mm. Kevin McCarthy was in it. Matthew Lillard. This is he's he makes a Matthew Lillard from Scream and Scooby Doo. Mm-hmm. He's one of the frat boys in this movie. He just has like one or two lines. It's his first role. Yeah. Uh, Eva Larue, who's in CSI Miami, she's like a big deal yeah. now. She's the girlfriend. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jason Scott Lee, who is who played Bruce Lee in the uh, Bruce Lee biopic Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, and it was also in the Jungle Book movie. He plays mm-hmm. one of the frat boys, um, which is kind of wild. Marsha Wallace, she plays the librarian lady. She is the voice of Edna Krabappel on The Simpsons. What? Yeah, and she doesn't speak a lot in the movie, but when she does, it sounds exactly like Edna Krabappel. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, the sexy, uh, blonde w- a woman who has sex a bunch and like get basically gets topless every time she's on screen is yeah. Hope, Hope Marie Carlton, who I guess was like a playboy bunny who we know from Hard Ticket to Hawaii. Oh my God. Uh, mm-hmm. blast from the past. Yeah. I want, if you're, you're a bit like, I recognize those boobs. It's because we saw I, that. I had that thought. It's because we've seen them before. Yeah, it's like that woman looks crisp, familiar. Crisp 420p on a <laughs> Blu-ray. Um, and then, okay, this is when it gets wild. So okay, uh, one of the frat boys is a, a, a actor named Griffin O'Neill. Mm-hmm. He uh, kind of has like, he just plays one of the frat boys. Not really a big part of the movie. His uh, sister is Tatum O'Neill. From Paper Moon? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so yeah, there's like a little connection to Hollywood there. That's cool. Nice, nice. So anyway, that that guy is interesting because he was um he was filming a Francis Ford Coppola movie in the eighties, I believe. Before Which they one? made this movie. It's called In the Garden of Something. In the Garden of Vino, the Francis Ford Coppola <laughs> winemaking process. Gardens of Stone? Yeah, that's probably it. Yeah, it's Gardens of Stone. Anyway, so he was working on a movie called Gardens of Stone with Francis Ford Coppola, the father yeah. of Sofia Coppola. Oh my God. Wow. I see where this is going. While he was making that movie, he went on a, a boat trip with Giancarlo Coppola, which is Sofia Coppola's brother. And yeah. he crashed the boat, killing Giancarlo Coppola. He was the one? He was the guy who killed like was responsible for the death of Sofia Coppola's brother. So he oh basically, my God, because of, I guess, connections to the, um, uh, they were both part of, part of Hollywood dynasties. I'm sure he was friends with the Coppola family. Yes. Yeah. So Griffin O'Neill basically was like working on this. And then he went to Francis Ford Coppola and was like, I gotta, I can't work on this movie anymore. I killed your son. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Anyway, Spike Jones aided Sofia Coppola, and uh, a character in Ghoulies Three killed her brother. Oh my god, that that is wild, man. That's some nice research. That, well, that was just that was a little uh, Wikipedia rabbit hole I went down, just because I was like, oh, the this guy uh, Griffin O'Neill is he related to Tatum O'Neill? And then I found that out, and then I sure basically enough. just kept digging, and then it was like, oh my god. Yeah, Jesus Sophia Coppola Christ, that's is really, crazy. Sophia Coppola is related to both of these movies in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, also, another. This is sort of irrelevant, but basically, so John Malkovich wanted to. John Malkovich received the script for being John Malkovich, mm-hmm. and he and his producing partner wanted to change the celebrity so that John Malkovich could direct it, and he and his production company and his producer would produce the film. Right, Charlie right. Kaufman said, I won't do it unless it's with you. And John Malkovich said, okay, no thanks. And he moved on. Shot this movie in France. The Jewel Heist movie. So he's in a little village in the south of France. Who calls him up but Francis Ford Coppola? And Francis Ford Coppola says, hey, I want you to set some time aside and meet with Spike Jones in Paris. And uh, he, and I'm, this isn't an exact quote, but I'm paraphrasing. But it, uh, he said, uh, we'll all be working for this kid soon, is what Francis Ford Coppola said oh, wow. in regards to Spike Jones. And so John Malkovich said, wow, that's a really high compliment coming from one of the you know, elite of Hollywood. And so 
uh, John Malkovich, met with Spike Jones, who was at the time with Sofia Coppola. And that's how the two of them met. And that was the relationship that started uh, Spike Jones's first film. Wow, wow. Which then led on to his very successful filmmaking career in, in the future world. So it's just, it's interesting how interrelated the Coppolas are with both films. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, can I make one more comparison uh, via Spike Jones? Yes. Spike Jones is tied in with the jackass guys. Like he mm-hmm. produces and, and sometimes plays a character Directs. in the jackass movies. And their whole thing, uh, especially in the Bad Grandpa franchise, uh, is pranking. Wow. In the, in yeah. the, the Ghoulies 3 vernacular, yanking. A yank is a yank is a yeah, yank. They say yank. I don't know. They call it prank week, but then they call them yanks. They should call it yank week. Yeah, they should call it yank week. I couldn't believe they called it yanking. I know. It was very. It took me out of the film. I couldn't watch it after. They kept saying yeah, yank. I, I believed everything up until that point. I know. Um, yank just y- yank yanked me out of the story is what <laughs> it did. So fuck, you know. So yeah, that was uh, that was uh, the comparisons between the film Her and uh, the uh, the movie that revolves around the phantasmagoric turlet, that being Ghoulies Three, Ghoulies Go to College. Nice, Mike, another great what epi. a way to end it. Another great. Yeah, this epi. was slick, man. Ghoulies Three has a lot going for it. It's actually mm-hmm. like filmed very funny. Like it's a good. It's well made. For what it is. Yeah. The jokes are bad. Like whenever a character actively makes a joke, it's bad. But that has some great special effects gags. Um, yeah, yeah. I love I love the joke where the closet opens and all the clothes fall on the ghoulies. And then when they st- pop up, they're wearing the clothes. Like that's a funny joke. <laughs> yeah. I love like that kind of stuff. And they have like yeah, they, they were... have these very curated outfits of like, so they look like frat kids. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, Fish Ghoulie is essentially, he look he's dressed like Fresh Prince. Essentially. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I like, I love that stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, Ghoulies 3 has a lot going for it. It's got, it's got friendship that between the three Ghoulies, I mean, um, mm-hmm. it's got Yanks, mm-hmm. which, you know, <laughs> AKA pranks. It's got Phantasmagoric Turlets. Yeah. It's got, uh, I guess, boobs in like large supply. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, like everybody in the sorority was just blonde. I know there was maybe that's how that frat houses weird, are it? in the states, but yeah, maybe you have to dye your hair in certain uh, frats. I don't know. Yeah, well, we yeah we don't live in the states. It's like when you become a skateboarder and you have to bleach blonde your hair. You know, especially in the early two thousands, just like everyone did it. Wait, you never went to university? No, I did briefly. Yeah, you went did yeah, briefly for one it... one semester in two weeks. Yeah, but you have not experienced frat culture, right? No, not really. Yeah, so, but what you you have an idea of what kind of frat culture is just through films. Y- yeah, and I've had friends in frats. Yeah, but have they, ha- is it like American frats? Because, like, I think American frats, they're important to America for some reason. Like, there's some sort of historic well, thing to it. Whereas Canada is just kind of like a thing that they stole from American colleges. It's definitely watered down here because frats yeah. historically, um, you know, like there there are really famous frats that like certain presidents were a member of. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, so so there's a lineage and a history um, associated, and they're also and a tied in, They're also tied into like groups like the Skulls or like the Illuminati. Like frats have a connection the Freemasons. to like Freemasons and stuff. Like frats kind of connect to these like dark parts of uh, the deep state. The the deep state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely watered down here. Mm-hmm. The functionality seems the same. It's really just people who want to make friends. Yeah. Um, but then there's all this toxic BS. Yeah, they but they um, it's, they feel like they have to do it. Well, yeah, because they want to be friends. Yeah. It's like we're in a frat. We have to lock somebody in a box and piss on them. <laughs> because <laughs> exactly. it's a frat, frat culture demands it. Yeah, yeah, and you you know, you can't change those things. Yeah. So that's that's history, goddammit. You know, I, you gotta protect it. Um anyway, we were saying about we were talking about frats before we talked about peeing. I wonder if um Theodore and uh Rooney Mara's character were in sororities and frats respectively. That would, I mean that would be a connection. Yeah. I it just you know, if only there was um 
a, you know, a, 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 a novel, so to speak, <laughs> associated with the film to help, you know, flesh out those details well, or flush them out as a, you know, a ghoulies phantasmagoric turlet reference. Not to, nice, nice. Not to go back mm-hmm, to, mm-hmm. The, not to go back to similarities because that segment's over and we're in the new, in a new segment. Yeah, the segment of when how do how do we tie this up? How do we end yeah. this goddamn thing? This it's runaway just, it's train. It's just light banter, you know. It's free form yeah, conversation. Yeah. yeah. Well, the the yeah Theodore and whatever Rooney Mara's character's name is, they I'll just look it up. They graduate college at some point before the movie Her starts. Her name's Catherine. Yeah, Catherine. Right. So we know that they have finished university because they said that they did. Uh, and on the Ghoulies Three poster. They're all wearing, they're all wearing their like university robes and hats, mm. while they're sitting in a turlet. So the three, the three wow. ghoulies are wearing university robes, and the rat ghoulie is holding a um, diploma. So basically, mm. they don't explore it in the film, but the ghoulies did they graduate? It's not impossible. Yeah, I mean, when most people cherish the moments of college when they're partying, they're not cherishing all of the learning they're doing. So we don't really yeah. see the ghoulies go to school, but it says ghoulies go to college on the title of the film. Essentially, mm-hmm. the movie is telling us they went to college. Like, they were learning, but we just never saw it because the film cleverly edited around it. Just like, you know, most movies edit around characters going to the bathroom. We we get them in toilets all the time. Toilets. <laughs> But um, <laughs> in the film, they not, we're not sure if they're using the washroom while they're in there. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so like the movie is editing around them learning, going to, going to class, mm. you know, getting their uh, humanities. You know, maybe one of them is in earth and atmospheric sciences or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Like who knows what the ghoulies are studying, but it's called ghoul- ghoulies go to college. They technically are probably learning something, and on the cover, it shows them in robes with a uh, diploma. So one can. Assume- you know what's interesting about that phrase too, Mike? Is you can't say like I went to college. Like if you're visiting for a day, you wouldn't say I went to college. You would say I visited yeah, exactly. this place. Um, so the title does denote that they went there, they <laughs> learned, and they garnered uh, degrees. Yeah. Well, they also were working at the college at one point. Because we see them working mm-hmm. for the deans. They're, they're technically the dean's assistant when the dean hires them to go murder those college kids which, for pranking. Which would suggest that they're master's students working on their dissertations and they're staffed by a professor. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> wow. We should write an accompanying novel just really fleshing out the details of specifically the third installment in the Ghoulies quadrilogy well what okay here's like here's a fun thing for this segment it's a mini game okay. we'll call it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what okay. what uh what degrees did the three ghoulies get while they were at school <laughs> sociology so, all so we three got, of them we got okay wow <laughs> <laughs> no okay sorry what were you gonna say no, i mean it can be sociology that's your answer that's fine i just think it'd be funny if they took sociology and they did sort of this systematic study of society yeah. Yet they come from the turlet world. <laughs> well, they seem to understand human society quite well. Or, well, yeah. And you know what? It actually makes, it would make sense for them to be sociology majors because then when they're delving into the, the frat world, they have this sort of innate fascination. And that fascination would be fueled by their passion for their degree. And maybe a project that the three of them are working on is a research project to figure out the culture and the sort of mini society built within a fraternity. Mm, nice. Man, and I'm, sociology courses do cover frats and sororities. That That is like, that's like so- sociology 101. Yeah. And you know what? So maybe they were, maybe they weren't summoned by the Dean. We just assume that because of the language of horror films, mm-hmm. you know, one you would assume, oh, someone's reading some ancient Latin text. Therefore we're going to summon some demons. But in this case, mm-hmm. they just happened to live in the turlet at that frat. So they were just frat boys. We didn't see them before the movie started. So they, we don't know what they were up to. They could have been, yeah. this could have been their fourth year, right? What, what, what degree do you think they're working on? I mean, uh, let's see. I'm looking at pictures of them right now. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, fish, fish, Ghoulie, the bald one who looks like a weird, gnarly baby. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say he um, is getting his, kind of getting his PhD in poli sci or like a poli okay. sci adjacent kind of like specific. He has a very specific track, like maybe kind of studying, I don't know, uh, globalization and how it pertains to uh, relationships between Asia and like United States. Okay. Cat Gooley, a weird bearded one. I think he's like yeah. straight up like he's, yeah, he's just getting a sociology degree. He doesn't really know what he wants to do he's with lost. his life. Yeah, he's lost. I, th- I think he's a little lost. I'm looking at him right now and his eyes are telling me <laughs> he doesn't know where he's going. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, canines <laughs> at home, play along, look up the Ghoulies 3 poster and just like, like look deep into the eyes of these these weird creatures as they sit on this phantasmagoric turlet. And um, mm-hmm. yeah. And then Rat Ghoulie. Um, yeah. What's he doing? I mean, he, yeah, I think Rat Ghoulie got a uh, theater. He's a theater major. Look at this slogan on the cover of this DVD sleeve. It says out of the bowl and totally out of control. Looking at the same one, but it's in French for some reason. And it says, enfant de retour, a total mont and controllables. So if you look, Mike, on one of the Ghoulies, the English Ghoulies DVD sleeve, it's the same font that Shrek uses. What? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. It's like green, green and spiky G. I kind of, yeah, I kind of want to see the rest of these movies. I do too. I also want to finish the Leprechaun Legacy. Uh, oh, um, the, there's the British one. It says the poster for the British Ghoulies release says Ghoulies go to college. It's not Ghoulies 3. It says Ghoulies go to college. They're back creating mayhem in the college lose is what that says at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, I, I, as, a, as a quick side note, from a technical standpoint, this film has several shots that the focus puller obviously shit the bed on and they left it in the movie. Like what? And uh, there's just a few moments, especially early on, a lot of the introduction shots in the, like on the campus, there's like walking shots and they're obviously out of focus and like the uh-huh. focus puller just like didn't get his marks right or the actors were way off. But, you know, as a fellow f- focus puller, I, I noticed that. And I also know how hard it is on film to pull focus. Um, and I, throughout the film, I just kept thinking, I bet the focus puller just wasn't given the right resources and time to really nail the focus on this movie. Because there are a couple scenes that are just straight up botched. Yeah. Um, or not scenes, but shots. And, like, nobody really cares, especially when you're watching it in 420p. It's kind of kind of interesting that it made it into the normally you cut around like shots that are out of focus, but they mm-hmm. just kind of I know shameful. I didn't notice. I didn't even notice that any of the shots were out of focus. I noticed that sometimes it was focusing on something where it should have been focusing on something else. I would call that out of focus. Oh, okay, then there you go. <laughs> Maybe it worked. Yeah, about the same like thing like then. when it's when it's like the guy in the background or like a bookshelf is like tack sharp, and the actor speaking who's ten feet in front of the bookshelf is not in focus. Mm-hmm. That's that's a mistake. Um, I'm also looking up uh, Eva Larue's IMDb, and yeah, I recognize her. She's been in so many TV shows. Yeah, she's had a great career. Yeah, and then she was in this movie of all movies like if you look at the amazing. Ghoulies movies none of them are really as star studded as Ghoulies 3 for some reason strange that the third installment would would have such a, a prestigious cast list I know considering it was the first of the straight to video Ghoulies movies not unlike Deucey Lep which was the last movie to hit the theaters I think in the Lep franchise before it went right right to um, right to video for the rest of them Deucey Lep. Interesting. Deucey Lep and Thricey Ghoul? Uh, no, that is yeah. Not. Yeah, well. Or Thricey you know, Turlet? Thricey Phantasmagorical tur- Turlet. <laughs> Thricey Phantasmagoric Turlet. All right, cool. Well, I feel like we've really covered all the bases of this, these two films. Um, Literally every base to be covered about these two movies. Yeah, yeah, all the bases. Um, I had a good time. This 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 was a fun combo, I have to say. Yeah, this was a fun combo. I would, I'm definitely going to seek out the rest of the um, 
Ghoulies franchise. The Ghoulies movies. And like while I was watching this and like kind of learning about the um the history of Charles Band and his kind of like the weird like Vestron video kind of world of straight to video movies or the connection to all of these other films that were just cheesy but practical effects 80s genre movies. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm just kind of like, I wanted to really do a deep dive on some of these old movies, either that I saw before or other ones that I haven't seen. And like we, I watched that, we watched this movie on Tubi, which is yes. like a free and Netflix, which has like a great selection of movies. You just have to watch commercials. And that's like, that's the payment, I guess. You just have to sit through a commercial here and there. And it's, it's really not bad. And yeah, also they're like Tubi, 30 seconds long. Tubi has a great selection of yeah. like those sort of 80s straight to tape movies yeah i know that's right that's why i was as i was watching ghoulies 3 i was like sifting through the other ones i'm like ooh, i gotta watch this i gotta watch this uh oh the the next film that was like suggested was called like microwave massacre yeah it's right. just about I saw like that. killing killing stuff in microwaves and i was like i'm i'm not above this i will sit through this film yeah i kind of want to watch some other like weird 80s creature featurey kind of puppet movies like ghoulies yeah yeah because they don't have the other ghoulies on there unfortunately but you can watch Ghoulies 4 on Amazon Prime, I think. Yeah, yeah. Also, how, how fortuitous that we wanted to watch specifically the third one, and that's the only one that Tubi had. Oh, I know. I know. That's, like, pretty pretty lucky. Like, all the Leprechaun movies are on Amazon, but only the third, um, Ghoulies, is on Tubi. I really want to watch this movie called Robot Jocks. Have you ever seen this movie? No, I haven't. Robot Jocks. That sounds good. It's basically, like, Pacific Rim, but in the 80s and cheesy and bad but it was actually pretty cool and it's kind of cre- it's kind of like related to Ghoulies 3 and the producing team and stuff although I think Charles Band didn't make Robot Jocks if I'm not mistaken he went on to make a um, another movie called Crash and Burn which was very similar yeah. but much much lower budget yeah Charles Band directed Crash and Burn uh, and Robot Jocks was not he was not affiliated I get with it. it. I think he was. But anyway, I've been trying to find Robot Jocks on Amazon. The DV, the Blu-ray for it, which came out like 10 years ago, is $200. Like, you can't get a copy of this movie now. Oh, God. Oh, it's like stop motion. I'm looking at the behind-the-scenes photos. Yeah. Oh, Stuart Gordon made Robot, Robot Jocks. That's why. Yeah. Um, yeah. This looks really good. Yeah. And like... What a great concept. If you're a Nine Inch Nails fan, which I am... Like they sample robot jocks in on the downward spiral, which is like cool. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. It's like basically Gundam, but like American with like battling robots. Yeah. And I remember watching that as a, a kid. It's like a movie my dad rented for us. And um, yeah. The if only little awesome. Mikey had foreseen that he should have kept the VHS or whatever oh, the know. hell it was, you know, and you could, you could sell it for some serious dough. Yeah. Well, this is like Robot Jocks because it's in, I would buy the Blu-ray if I could find it, but I can't. But $200 so. is fucked. Well, I mean, like, that's, that's just that's ridiculous. That's just Amazon. It was like made by Shout Factory, it looks like, based on my research. So I'm sure there's some place that has it somewhere. Like I'm sure you can yeah. find like a $10 copy of it somewhere on the internet. So this might be a pirating, a pirating thing. Buy the, oh yeah, shoutfactory.com. It's sold out on their website. Yeah. Normally it's 24 bucks, which isn't the end of the world. Interesting. You can buy the VHS on yeah, Amazon, which is hilarious. How much does that so the, cost? The VHS is <laughs> just we're just doing a podcast of us going on Amazon and looking through stuff. <laughs> it's just it's forty seven dollars. Jeez, what a bummer! Shit like this should be so easy to get, but like copyright gets so muddy, and you know, but but just, also it'll just it'll just pop up randomly one day. One sh- Shout Factory sells the rights to like some streaming service. It'll pop up on Tubi randomly, and then it'll yeah. disappear in a couple of months. Like that happens all the time when you're like, oh, I've been wanting to see this movie forever, and you can't find it. You can't find it, and then all of a sudden it just pops up on Amazon Prime, like with no fanfare. We can find Robot Jocks. Maybe that might be a bad movie or a good movie, depending on how how it fares. I think it was panned, but. I'm actually shocked that it's not on YouTube. Yeah, I'm actually shocked too. There's Robot Wars, but yeah, not Robot Jocks. Wars, not Robot Jocks. Yeah, I hate you know, and it, the fact that it's so hard to get makes me want to watch it even more. Oh, I know, I know. You just lust for what you can't have, you know. I lived through that era of movies, and I just really took it for granted. Here's the thing, though, like this is in several basements across North America, just sitting on a shelf or like sitting in a bin. 
And that's the real bummer. Yeah. Is is that it's owned by people who don't realize how sought after this stupid fucking movie is. You oh, know I know. What I mean? Well, the fact that it's a thousand dollars on Amazon is ludicrous. That means that somebody realized that somebody's willing to pay that much. And I'm one of those people. <laughs> Just like well, I mean, you you as a gamer are your whole gaming life revolves around the GameCube. And you you famously yeah, paid I, I only play retro. Yeah, you famous you famously paid a thousand dollars to play Shrek Swamp Smash, I believe it's called on GameCube, <laughs> like the Smash Brothers clone. Um, but that's neither here nor there. I don't <laughs> think you need to tell the canines how I spend my money, Mike. Okay, that's a real, real. You're really, you know, stepping out here, buddy. Okay, okay maybe I spent a thousand dollars on the Shrek fighting game, <laughs> but that's between me and my credit card company, not between you and me and all. 15 canines that listen to this podcast okay the, the gamecube era was the pinnacle kind of like that era gamecube slash gameboy advance era that timeline was the pinnacle mm-hmm. of mike myers themed video games like or mike myers property video games like yeah, in the 90s yeah. we had the wayne's world super nintendo game and that was pretty much it uh, but in the in the early 2000s, you had multiple Shrek games. You had multiple Austin Powers games. You imagine you own a Game Boy Color and you also love Austin Powers. There's a game for you, and it is it is Shagadelic. I, I wasn't aware of that. I think I might have to uh, save up again and start spending my money. Yeah, on uh, on games here. Um, I just wow! After this podcast recording, I'm going to go straight down the rabbit hole of the internet looking for hot deals well, on antiquated games. Well, that was a bit of a segment within a segment. We did a bit of like an Amazon corner within our totally, witty totally ban- witty like our freeform banter com- conversation uh, segment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that was good. Should we, should we, should we uh, tie tie this uh, thing up and uh, p- put a bow on it? Yeah, tie it uh, tie it up like. Like a ribbon around the diploma of a ghoulie graduating. Nice. From college. Nice. From with their BA in theater. <laughs> um, That's rat ghoulie we're talking about. He's yeah, specifically major. rat rat ghoulie. Not fish ghoulie. My favorite ghoulie. Um great. So um I hope you enjoyed this episode, everyone. Um her is a genuinely great film to sit through and watch and uh if you've ever had your heart broken, it's good. If you've ever been in love, it's good. Um, if you just like Spike Jones, it's good. And Ghoulies 3, Ghoulies, Ghoulies Go to Go college. to College. Um, if you want to see a really turlet-centric uh, filmmaking style, I would strongly suggest you take the time, watch it for free on Tubi with a couple ads, and, uh, you know, Send us some emails about what your thoughts are um, on this, uh, dare I say, the magnum opus of the franchise. Yeah, I mean, that's a good segue right there to just some promo stuff. Yeah. Because we haven't done that in a while. Go on uh, well, Twitter. Follow us from Justin to Kane with the number two. Follow us on yes. Instagram from Justin to Kane with the number two. Follow us on Facebook if you want, because, uh, <laughs> you know, Facebook sucks. But uh, I actually... Just as a side note, I deleted Facebook yesterday. Yeah, see, there you go. I, I'm, I want I'm off to. Of Facebook. I want to, but it's such like a good email service. I guess maybe I'll just get Facebook Messenger. Really, I'll just keep that. I'm still tied yeah, you're, into you're the able ecosystem. To, yeah, but, yeah. If you yeah. want, you you can like deactivate your account instead of delete it, and just keep Messenger, which I thought about doing, and then I was like, no, no, I need to go all the way. Well, yeah, but if you're on Instagram, you're still tied into Zucky's. Uh, ecosystem of some kind so i'm I'm still sucking on the teed of mark zuckerberg yeah for they sure. own, like, they own like the rest of in, us they own instagram i know that you famously have an oculus rift also that you use for your star wars <laughs> yes. holiday special-esque shenanigans <laughs> vr shenanigans, shenanigans and like they own yeah. they own oculus rift so yeah yeah no i i try to get away from zuckerberg and i just lose yeah um but you you know it is what it is so anyway, Facebook, we also have that from Justin DeCane with a number two. Email us from Justin DeCane at gmail.com. All regular words, no numbers. Go on. Uh, That's confusing, uh, hey? Uh, I mean, yeah, I should have got it all with the number two, but. <laughs> uh, whatever. I got the email first. 
And then right, some of right. some of them some of them won't let you use a certain amount of characters, which is why we had to settle on the oh, number two. I see. I so see. from Justin to Kane, those are all of our socials. And then also go on Apple Podcasts or some other podcast service you like. Give us a rating or even a review because that makes people discover us, apparently. And tell tell your friends about us and recommend it to you... some canines to be. Yeah, yeah. If 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 you got a couple of canines in your life and they're looking, they're w- whimpering for uh, you know <laughs> some some delicious auditory uh, slabs of meat. We call them. Yeah, slabs of meat. Um, you know, just please, please send them send them our way. And by that, I mean tell them to listen to this show. Yeah, we want to actually interact with them. Yeah. yeah, especially during COVID. You know, we're we're locked in here. And then there's also the plethora of like fake websites that we advertise every week. You can also go to those if you want. <laughs> you you can certainly try. You can, yeah, certainly, you can certainly try. try we so. have a large presence on the dark web now. I've spent the last few weeks just mm-hmm. uh, getting some websites up and running. So look up on the dark web um, from Justin and Kane, the podcast. And there's lots of funny stuff there, too. Yeah, a lot of funny stuff. A lot of things that will radicalize you into being like an incel. So that's also a thing <laughs> that just watch out for that. But it's it's there. Yeah, that's a good caution. Thanks, yeah. Mike. Yeah, I, I I think that's it. I think I think that's uh, this week's uh, epi. Okay. Um. Well, s- s- see you later, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.